Good evening, everybody. My name is Fred Bertino. I'm joined by my wonderful co-host and colleague, Annette Roberts. Annette, how are you tonight? Good. How are you, Fred? I'm doing wonderful. We've got a fantastic webinar planned uh, for you all. I'm super grateful that you're all joining us this evening and, and you're going to learn some pretty high yield information about radiology that is most likely to appear on the USMLE and COMLEX exams. Um, Again, my name is Fred Bertino. I'm a radiologist. Uh, I'm joined here with Annette, who is a pediatrics resident. So good to work with you again, Annette. I always love our webinars that we get to team up and do these kinds of things together. Absolutely. Annette, um, before we jump into everything over here, can you enlighten me into some of your insights as to what you've seen um, on the exam, just kind of in general when it comes to radiology and give our, our listeners some, some pointers, uh, just kind of general concepts that, that might be important? Absolutely. I know imaging can be extremely scary for some students and it's really not. So you guys don't have to be too concerned. Just know the vignette is gonna guide you and always base your knowledge on the vignette. You can look at the x-ray first, you can look at the image first, but at the end of the day, the vignette is going to guide you 100%. They're not expecting you to be a radiologist on this exam. I love that. I And I, I couldn't agree more. Real quick, before we jump into some of our content today, uh, a word from Blueprint and Med School Tutors, the, the combination that has really made medical education uh, for these board exams is, as seamless as possible, um, with a combination of various kind of resources like Cram Fighter, one-on-one -on -one tutoring from our amazing Med School Tutors uh, cohort with uh, offers in residency consulting and even new QBanks from Ross Review, um, we hope that we can take you from start to finish with your uh, preparation uh, with experts in the field who can guide you in whatever your career aspirations are, whether that begins and ends with just an amazing score on your exam or even life advice when it comes to looking for residencies and careers. So moving forward here, uh, now why don't you tell us a little bit what we're going to talk about this evening? So we're going to walk you through a ton of different images. We're going to walk you through a lot of x-rays and a lot of CT scans. That's what we're focusing on. Uh, so we'll start you guys off with a couple basics. Um, and we can use the chat. We can be a little interactive. Um, if you guys have know what it is, you can feel free to text in the chat. Uh, so we'll walk you through a bunch of different images. And we'll kind of describe the vignette that would go along with those images as well. Um, and hopefully, you guys will get a little bit more comfortable on regarding these really high yield images that we have for you today. Fantastic. Um, as always in classic uh, Blueprint and MST fashion, we will always end every webinar we do with a live Q&A. So if you've got questions for us that you would love Annette and I to weigh in on, please absolutely go forward and um, you know, please go forward with uh, asking us questions as you see fit, of course, in real time along with our webinar. And if you wanted to save them to the end, Annette and I are going to be around for some time afterwards and discuss anything you want to, to ask us a little bit more about. So without further ado, let's jump into some initial uh, imaging here. Um, some general tips, Annette. Uh, anything uh, that you can elaborate on from this slide over here? To kind of touch base on some of this already, the vignette is extremely important. Make sure you use the vignette to guide you in any image that you do. Um, any image that you're going to see, it's going to be high yield information. They're not going to give you an image of something that's not in first aid. If there's an image involved, this is a high yield point and it's a classic pathology that you should know. Uh, so you can use your knowledge that you already have to be able to identify the um, image and figure out what it is without actually knowing the image fully. If you don't recognize the image, don't panic. Like I said, you can go back to the vignette. There's going to be hints that are going to help you um, get to the correct um, answer. And I already mentioned this before, you don't need to be a radiologist to do well on this exam. And the USMLE is not expecting you to be a radiologist. Uh, so use these, what we go through today to kind of sh help you figure out what is high yield and it'll get you comfortable. But at the end of the day, you're, you, you don't need to know everything, um, know all the images to do well on this exam. Excellent advice, Annette. And on that note, how fortuitous of you to be paired up with me and a radiologist with extremely high expectations. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> 
no, no comment. Okay, well, <laughs> moving forward, <laughs> moving forward with some cases. We'll start with um, a, an, an approach to radiography and chest radiographs. Um, many of you probably have had a little bit of a baseline uh, review in this, whether it's part of your med school coursework or whether you're on the wards. Um, from a personal standpoint, I think that anybody on a clinical rotation or anybody going into any areas of medicine, I kind of equate a chest radiograph to be equivalent to that of an EKG. I kind of expect everybody to know the basics of them and be able to pick one up at will and be able to give at least a, a wet read or a baseline interpretation to them. Um, we don't rely solely on cardiologists to be the only people who can interpret an EKG. I certainly wouldn't expect you all in the hospital to be the uh, to rely on a on a radi uh, on a radiologist to interpret a chest radiograph because these are arguably the most commonly ordered studies in a hospital setting. That said, uh, from a radiologist, I believe these to be the most difficult studies to interpret accurately from time to time. Uh, there's a lot of nuance that goes on with radiography. Uh, and a lot of various signs um, that we kind of hold everybody uh, to a standard to, uh, to interpret, especially in the acute setting. Um, if you've been on a rotation, you'll know the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E. Sometimes this can be extended to F or G or all the way through the alphabet, depending upon who's writing the mnemonic. But for our purposes here, we'll keep it to a five letter mnemonic. Uh, Annette, you wanna take us through what this actually means? Sure. So A for airway. and this is like perfect because in pediatrics, we, um, just to kind of segue off of what you said, Fred, um, we are, as residents, we're expected to at least be able to like look at an image and really just know the basics of it. And so I'll guide you through kind of how we teach our medical students in my hospital and how we as residents are expected to go through a chest x-ray and this approach, um, I'm sure you all are familiar with. So you're gonna use this throughout your medical career. So A, airway mediastinum. So you always wanna first look at the actual, just like kind of take a look at what you can see, what is the biggest in the picture? And that's usually the lungs, right? The airway. So you wanna see the actual lungs. You wanna see um, how, how um, inflated they are and how, if they're symmetrical, you wanna look at the mediastinum and make sure is it cent centered or is there some kind of deviation? Breathing. Uh, you want to look at the diaphragm. Is the diaphragm flat? Is the diaphragm round? Are they equals? Are they symmetrical? The bones, you want to look at the different ribs. Can you, how many ribs can you count? A lot of the times you can have an idea of if, if you can have an idea of the lungs are hyperinflated by how many ribs you can count. And you also want to see, is there a possibly a fracture involved? Was there some kind of trauma involved? And you could possibly see broken bones around the ribs. Uh, or like of the ribs or around um, the chest wall. Circulation, you will see cardiac. You wanna look at the heart. Is the heart small? Is the heart large? Um, is the heart in the appropriate position? Is it too far to the um, left or is it um, reversed? Those are things you wanna look at. Um, D, we go back to the diaphragm. So diaphragm, you wanna look more, look at the actual angles. Is there a pleural effusion that we might be seeing? Um, or is there a consolidation that's, um, involved near the diaphragm and near the costophrenic um, angles. And then extras, you, the lines important. I know for um, the US Assembly, they're not important, but when you're in an ICU setting, lines and cords are extremely important. Hardware also, if you will see, like if a patient has a scoliosis repair, you'll see different hardwares. Um, there are different devices like pacemakers. So those are all, I think this is like an ABCDE is a great way to just kind of to approach a chest x-ray and really make sure you're covering all of the important um, parts of an x-ray. Amazing review there. Very, very good in that. Very thorough as well. Um, all important things to go through is you can see that there's uh, a lot of things in just a five letter mnemonic that are very important to keep in mind. Um, with that, we'll, we'll hope to highlight some of the important anatomy and pathology as we go forward with this. So what I'm showing everybody here is a, a normal chest radiograph. It is in the PA projection, meaning that the beam comes from the back of the patient and the patient's front of the chest is up against the detector. So the source of the beam in PA radiographs goes from posterior to anterior in terms of the direction of the beam. That's probably why they are named that. Maybe some of you have been wondering that at the same time. 
I'm going to take you some anatomy. We've got these beautiful little drawings and overlays over the, uh, the chest radiograph itself to help identify some of the normal anatomic structures. You can see the aortic knob over here, the heart with a left-sided uh, left ventricle, which is a uh, normal anatomic position. And of course, I'll take a moment just to orient ourselves. Remember that when we interpret imaging of any kind, um, you know, there's, you can argue that radiologists have left, right confusion, but we're not, we're actually just looking at the patients face on as if we're having a face to face conversation with them so that my right hand is um, on my right side, but their right hand is on their right side. So radiology right and left is if you were talking to a person or a friend in person staring directly at them. It is always with respect to standard anatomic position, the patient's right, the patient's left, which is why um, over on this side of my screen uh, is my right side. And over on this side of my screen is my left side, if you were able to see my mouse there. Um, so just some, some uh, basic anatomy right here for our chest radiograph. And then this is our lateral um, that gives us kind of an idea of what the chest looks like from the side. You can see on the back here, because the spine is oriented toward the back, the heart is obviously going to project over the front. Um, you've got the sternum outlined over here. The little circle that could be winking at you in the middle of the chest radiograph is always the left main bronchus because it goes out a bit straighter. Uh, so you can see it on foss or down the barrel. That is what that means. And uh, oftentimes shoulders and arms have a tendency to get in the way of our chest radiographs on the lateral projection. So if you see a difficulty, um, you know, seeing through things on the, on the upper lobes of the lateral side, always keep in mind that that might just be superimposition of your upper extremities. <laughs> So when it comes to types of opacification on a chest radiograph, we have three major uh, uh, signs that you could look for. Linear or reticular opacities look like small little lines or little um, squiggles that could appear inside of uh, the lungs themselves. Nodular airspace opacities, which I like to think of as circles, um, you know, or big cannonballs, so to speak. And then airspace opacities look more like consolidation occupying areas of alveoli. Um, sometimes people might describe them as clouds, but nodular can also be described as clouds too, depending upon how many nodules are in the chest. Annette, taking a look at this first case over here, what can you describe for me? Now, when it comes to taking cases in radiology as a radiologist, I always start with how I think about a report to be formatted, right? So when you're reading a radiology report, I always start with the findings. So basically the descriptors that are going on with the case. And then after that, I tend to think more about the impression. So the ultimate diagnosis that goes into the report. So why don't you just be descriptive about this and tell me what you're seeing. Okay, so we get start with the A's. So the first thing I see right away is that I see a lot of like airspace disease. So I see a lot of lines. So like reticular, like linear reticular lines here. Um, I, when I go to B, so breathing and bones. So I could tell that this patient is probably not breathing well because I can't see a lot of air. And any, and I see a lot of, I guess, airspace disease that's blocking what would, what my patient would be like, basically there's a lot blocking any air coming in and um, circulating through the lungs. And then I look at the bones and I don't really see anything right away. I know I can't see the ribs totally. Usually I'll count the ribs. Um, here it's kind of difficult to do that. So I don't think that's necessary here. I look at the mediastinum, it seems pretty centered to me, but what I, else I see is for C, the cardiac silhouette is very difficult for me to see. And also when I look at all of this, it kind of looks like congestion to me. It has kind of a fat wing consolidation with it. Um, so anything else you wanna to add to that, Fred? I think that was a great way of going through this radiograph in that mnemonic type fashion. You've definitely covered all the major points. Um, I'm going to also provide you with a little bit of history, which I know is few and far between with some of these radiographs when we get them on, on the clinical side. So remember, if you're not going into radiology and you're going to be the one ordering a lot of these studies, always provide your radiologist with as great a history as you possibly can. The more specific you are with your histories, the more specific we can give you an answer for what's going on. But Annette, if I were to tell you that this person had a history of hypertension, diabetes, and worse shortness of breath that got worse uh, with walking and a declining oxygen saturation, um, what might you think could be going on with somebody like this? 
and they had crackles on their physical exam? That's a great question. And let's have the, have you guys answer that one first before I jump in. So use the chat box and let us know what you're thinking. Yes, absolutely. Type as you will into the chat box. I don't want to take too much time here because I, I certainly want everybody to have an, an opportunity to, to see as many cases as possible. So some people writing here, um, good, good thought, heart failure when it comes into it. You can't really diagnose heart failure on a chest radiograph or any kind of imaging, okay? Heart failure is a clinical diagnosis that's a several different clinical signs and symptoms as well as some imaging parameters, okay? Um, so we can't get as specific as heart failure unless we saw multiple other clinical signs and symptoms, but we can say that there are some correlates that could suggest that chest radiographs can be seen in patients with heart failure. But what specific signs did Annette describe before? I'm seeing a lot of pulmonary edema pop up here. With the history, I would say that that is an outstanding diagnosis here. Um, the reticular patterns that Annette was describing are basically fluid-filled areas of um, alveoli that have a tendency to be along the bronchovascular bundles. These are basically veins, uh, pulmonary veins that are engorged with fluid because like in heart failure, you can have some regurgitation of that blood through the back part. The pulmonary pressures become high. You get that engorgement and thickening of some of those pulmonary veins that go along the airways. And if you see it more predominantly early stage in the upper lobes, we call that cephalization. We can see those reticular opacities all the way up there. And definitely more of an alveolar pattern of edema lower down is and that described as more of that bat wing appearance um, with more of the air spaces themselves at the lower lung zones becoming more full of fluid. So great job, Annette and everybody who went with pulmonary edema and curly B lines. Uh, curly B lines, you might also see in reports as an example of these this linear reticular pattern at the upper and peripheral lung zones to represent engorged pulmonary veins. Wonderful job. Here's another one for us. I'll, I'll work through this. If we're gonna go through our A, B, C, D, E pattern, if I'm looking at the airway, it's nice and midline, the mediastinum. Doesn't look too abnormal to me, except for the fact that the heart is a bit narrow toward the middle of the chest. Um, if I'm thinking about B for bones and breathing, um, my bones look basically normal everywhere that I can find. I can certainly see a, a, a plethora of posterior ribs. If I had to determine what was going to be a posterior versus an anterior rib on the chest, I think about it as frowny faces and smiley faces. So frowny face ribs, the ones that look like a frown are going to be posterior. And the ones that loop around the front are going to be more of your smiley face ribs. Those are going to be your anterior ribs. So lots of posterior ribs here, which means there's probably a big inspiratory effort on the side of this person. And if I go down to the breathing part, I would agree. I think this person is hyper inflated. I'm seeing a lot of lung here a lot of dark lung as well, meaning those air alveoli are quite full, potentially even overfilled with air. Cardiac C silhouette, again, I mentioned that it's nice and uh, kind of midline here. It's a bit flattened along this left ventricular border here with hyper expanded lungs. D, the diaphragm, a bit flattened here as well and pushed inferiorly. Um, and then E, everything else, I don't see any lines or tubes or anything there. Um, in this person who a, has a 25 year history of smoking with a chronic cough and multiple episodes of pneumonia in the past and, and is on home O2, uh, any guesses from our audience? Seeing a lot of really great ones. Annette, do you wanna read out some of the ones that you like the most? Definitely, COPD, flattened diaphragm, um, lung emphysema, COPD, good job guys. I love that as an answer, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Remember that COPD on your exams is a combination. It's a combined obstructive pulmonary disease. The combined there means it's a combination of two different pulmonary diseases, meaning that it's a combination of emphysema and chronic bronchitis. The chronic bronchitis part is the part where you get that clear sputum getting coughed up, that sputum getting caught into those airways and causing obstructive lung disease, and the emphysema being the destruction of that capillary border in that alveoli that's separates them all together. The alveolar air spaces get full of air, which explains the hyperinflation and the inability to take an to make an ins expiratory effort because of that mucus plugging and the inability of the alveoli to collapse. Laplace's law, remember that from your physiology. Um, that's going to be that combination of that obstructive lung disease. Great job, everybody. Excellent choice. Annette, why don't you talk us through this one? So immediately I see that there's asymmetry going on. 
So airway, there's asymmetry. Mediastinum, I see that the mediastinum is not centered here. So you, if you look here, you could see our trachea is pushed over. There should be more centered. And then we're seeing the heart, it's almost pushed over a little bit as well, right? And then, so we go to breathing and now we can see that our lung cavities are asymmetric. The right side, right side of the patient is clearly much larger. And it's darker too, which means there's more air there. And you also are kind of losing the different like bronch, uh, like uh, pulmonary vasculature. So you see vasculature here. On that side, you're not seeing as much of it. And then you kind of see this, when you look in the right, you can see a border of something else. So what do you guys think that border could be? Based on that question, and I'm seeing a lot of people suggest atelectasis of that lung. Do you agree with that assessment? So atelectasis, I, I see why people are saying atelectasis, um, because you can have some mediastinal shift with atelectasis, but this is not atelectasis. Um, this is what we've, other people have been saying, attention pneumothorax. So this is actually the lung collapsed, that line. And then all this dark space above it is all air and because there's air trapping that cavity is getting so large that it's pushing over the mediastinum and you don't atelectasis will show pulmonary changes and it could have a slight mediastinal shift but you would not at least in my experience you don't see um effects that are that severe and significant Sure. I want to give some credit to the people who did say atelectasis at the very least, because I like where their mind's at, right? They're thinking that atelectasis, meaning lung collapse or like a, a removal of the air from the air spaces, and that's going to cause a decrease in the volume of that lung. And in that, in that definition, you are all absolutely right. Okay. Remember that plural problems can result in compression of the lung and therefore atelectasis. But if we put atelectasis on um, in our impression here, that's, that's only kind of half of the story here. Uh, the ultimate diagnosis, as I agree with everybody who's, who said it, and I know a lot of you gave, gave both answers there, tension pneumothorax is certainly the best one to go with over here. But you are all correct in the sense that the lung here is collapsed, okay? I think about atelectasis and collapse as a spectrum. Collapse is going to be the entire collapse of the lung, which is what's happening here. If it's collapse, you got to say the word collapse. Atelectasis doesn't fully tell the story, but the pathophysiologic process of compressive atelectasis from a mass effect plural process that is squeezing the lung down in shape is 100% correct. So all of you who thought that pathophysiologic process there are correct with that. So good job with your thinking process. Um, wonderful. All right, we've got a multiple choice question here, all right, based on a chest radiograph. I'm going to give everybody a chance to read this out uh, to themselves. Annette, you can obviously take us through this, and I'll give everybody an opportunity to uh, come up with some thoughts. And I think we've got some uh, answer choices on the next slide. So I'll, I'll, I'll put this up here. Annette, why don't you take us through this question, and we'll go to the next slide and discuss the answer choices. Great. So I'll read it out loud. A 34-year-old African-American woman with a history of asthma presents the emergency department complaining of a dry cough and worsening shortness of breath for the past six months. Review of systems reveals decrease in visual acuity. Her family history is notable for a maternal aunt who died suddenly from cardiac arrest at 41. Physical exam reveals vitals, 99.1 temperature, a blood pressure of 110 over 82, a heart rate of 74, a respiratory rate of 20, and O2 saturation of 96% on room air, and decreased breath sounds at the basis bilaterally. The patient's laboratory findings on admission are as follows. And so sodium, 137, potassium, 3.8, chloride, 100, bicarb, 24, magnesium, 1.9, calcium, 10.8, phosphate, 3. Just note that on the actual US assembly, you don't have to remember the values. You can look those up. And so I'll give you a hint that they're all normal. On pulmonary function testing, her FVC is 70% of predicted and her FEV1 over FVC. So basically the ratio is 0.85. And that you actually do have to memorize. And then here we have our chest x-ray. Okay. So moving to our answer slide here, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? All 
I'll go back to the image and the question here for a second. Take this in for a moment. And then putting everything together with the clinical vignette and the chest radiograph, here are your answer choices, A through F. We'll give people about five seconds to give their answer. And then Annette, I'll have you kind of take us through your thought process. Some good answers going. Perfect. Everyone got it right. <laughs> Fantastic. I think sarcoidosis is a good answer here, correct? Absolutely. Wonderful. Walk us through this a little bit. Sure. So if we go back to the vignette, we can kind of break down the vignette itself. So 34-year-old African-American woman. That alone right there gives you a lot. And that's important. So 34, the peak incidence of sarcoidosis is between 25 and 35 years of age. And then again, at 50 to 65, and it's more common in women, two to one ratio actually. And it's 10 times higher uh, chance of seeing it among black women. Um, so history of asthma presents to the emergency room complaining of a dry cough and worsening shortness of breath. So you're getting that worsening shortness of breath, that dry cough from the fibrosis that's resulting from the sarcoidosis in the lungs. Review of system reveals decrease in visual acuity. And so these patients can develop granul granulomatous uveitis, and that can cause visual acuity issues. Uh, it could also, there, you can also see ocular sarcoidosis. So that's the visual acuity. Of course, you don't need to know that to get this answer right, but that's why they're bringing it up, it up to give you a couple more hints. Family history is notable for an aunt who died from um, cardiac arrest. So you can see restrictive cardiomyopathy in sarcoidosis. So it's possible that this aunt's cardiac arrest had some uh, sarcoidosis involvement as well. Um, that can kind of hint to it. Um, but again, you don't need to, that piece of information to get this question correct. And you go through the lab findings. All of those are normal, but our pulmonary function testing is not normal. So our FEVC is 70%. So FEVC is forced vital capacity and it's low. So normal is 80% to 120%. And it is low in both restrictive and obstructive diseases. So at least we know there's obviously a disease process, but then we can tell that this is a restrictive process based on a ratio. And the ratio is elevated. And that's how we know that there's some kind of restrictive process going on and um, some kind of fibrosis going on. And then we can look at our image after we've read our vignette and see that our image actually supports what we're saying. And so Fred, do you wanna go through the, um, the image? And what you see here. Absolutely. It looks like we've got a single view radiograph here. Um, and, you know, going through the ABCDE mnemonic, I'll kind of cut to the chase here. Um, mediastinal structures and um, I should say airway looks pretty good, but the mediastinal structures, I'm noticing a little bit too much bulk in this mediastinum, kind of around the pulmonary hilum. And then at the same time, I'm seeing a lot of nodular opacities um, throughout both lung fields. Diaphragms, I'm not particularly worried about. Bones, I'm not particularly worried about on this particular area. But given kind of the clinical scenario, as well as the findings in this patient, I would argue that this person has disseminated pulmonary sarcoidosis. The hilar adenopathy are characterized by these larger kind of expanded hilar um, uh, lymph nodes over here that we're seeing kind of crowding the, the um, vascular uh, pedicles, as well as kind of this nodular appearance that might be all throughout the, um, the lung fields. Now, this is a pretty advanced case of sarcoid. Oftentimes, you might just find the hilar adenopathy. This is truly the bat wing appearance, as it sometimes is called. But really, anytime you have that enlargement of the vascular bundles at the mediastinum, that's typically when you can kind of use that buzzword. Um, in this case, um, pretty, pretty advanced um, pulmonary sarcoid here. So um, when it comes to some question stems, you might have some other possible questions, and we won't go through all of these because we definitely want to focus more on um, the imaging components to our webinar. But remember that the exam can ask you a variety of different questions based upon the same kind of vignette. So really focus when, during your study on having a, a pretty global interpretation on what you need to know when it comes to these various disease processes. They can get quite creative with these, including second, third, fourth, fifth order questions when it comes to stuff. So, um, you know, be intelligent when it comes to your studying, really think outside the box when it comes to thinking about how they might be able to write questions um, to really test the full extent of your knowledge of a disease. All right. Well, um, 
shifting a little bit of gear here, um, not so much a chest radiograph, but I'm going to pass this one to Annette because as a pediatrics resident, I anticipate that she might see this, this neck radiograph quite often. Uh, what if I told you this was a five-year-old with a fever for two days and a violent cough that sounds like a barking seal? It's interesting, Mad. There, this is such a classic radiograph that you need to know for the boards, and you'll even see it for your step two when you do your pediatric shelf. But it's interesting because we don't you need you don't need a chest X-ray to diagnose this, and we don't usually get chest X-rays for this. Um, so I don't see it as often as you would think. Um, but yes, you guys are completely correct. It is croup, and it is our classic steeple sign. If we move on to the next slide, we'll see, you could see the actual steeple that they talk about. And so Fred said everything. Young kid um, started with a cough that sounds like a seal barking cough, and um, there could be some associated respiratory distress with that. And we give these kiddos racing McEpi. Absolutely correct, one hundred percent. Um, looking at some amazing answers here, you've all gotten it right. Steeple sign is the correct uh, imaging finding here, and croup is the right diagnosis. Great job. Okay, shifting gears here a little bit, we've got uh, we're going to move into the abdomen, and we're going to focus a little bit on uh, CT scans. They love to show cross-sectional imaging on the exams as well, not just so much for um, testing your pathology, again, as Anand had, had very well said before, they're not expecting you to be a radiologist on this test, but cross-sectional imaging is a great way to test your knowledge of anatomy because, let's face it, as a practicing doctor, you are more likely to encounter anatomy in the form of imaging than you are as a cadaver on a table in the morgue, unless, of course, you go into pathology or if you become a surgeon, then that becomes a lot more important for you to know. But for uh, basically everybody else, uh, imaging is going to be your number one way to identify the anatomy, and they love to ask anatomy questions on the step exams. So um, we'll talk about kind of big uh, anatomic areas here that you would be expected to know. Taking you through the aorta, realize that this is going to be a retroperitoneal structure that is going to basically be in the back here. So in image A, um, this is the lower part of the chest, mid to lower part of the chest. This is the descending thoracic aorta as indicated by my red circle in image A. My abdominal aorta is going to be a little bit more right in the midline. Again, a very posterior retroperitoneal structure just on top of the vertebral body there, again, denoted by the red circle. <laughs> And then the aorta is going to bifurcate into two common iliac arteries, which are uh, identified by these smaller red circles, whoops, over here. <laughs> Go back to that. There we are. Uh, moving forward, we have an IVC here, which is going to be the biggest vein in our abdomen, okay, drains all of the blood from the lower extremities. Uh, in image A over here, I'm showing you kind of in the direction as it moves up because we're following the direction of blood flow. And my purple circles in image A really are common femoral veins. Um, that's going to be indicated here. And remember, veins in the body typically are more expansive and a bit larger in diameter than our arteries. So if you were needing to tell the difference between the femoral artery versus the femoral vein, the larger of the two circles which is easier to be squished into an ovoid structure, chances are that's going to be your vein. Because remember, arteries are muscular. They're hard to compress. Veins, very squishy, very compliant by comparison. In image B here, we've got our uh, purple circle denoting our IVC to the right of our aorta. Remember, veins have a tendency to be right-sided structures in the body. If you think about it, arteries have a tendency to be left-sided structures in the body. Why is this the case, especially in the abdomen? Because, well, the aorta is a left-sided structure because the left ventricle is a systemic ventricle. It's a left-sided structure. And the blood return to our heart goes to the right atrium, which is a right-sided thoracic structure, which means our largest veins in the body have a tendency to be on the right side of our body. Um, moving forward in image C here, this is going to be at the level of the renal veins. You can see the renal veins coming into the, our purple circle over here. And then in image D, this is the intrahepatic portion of the vena cava before it crosses the diaphragm at the hiatus and enters the uh, right atrium at the uh, inferior cavoatrial junction. 
Okay. We've got a lot of solid organs in the body. Okay. Starting at the lower chest here, my blue circle in our first image here is our heart. Our pericardium is the uh, small, uh, very thin tissue that would surround the heart. In normal people's hearts without any pathology, you wouldn't expect to find really the pericardium at all. It can be a very, very thin, almost sometimes invisible structure, but when diseased or if there's a pericardial um, issue, um, it becomes a bit more obvious when there's a problem with it. Uh, moving down here over to my next image, this triangular structure in the left posterior hemiabdomen is going to be our spleen. Spleen is a, a reticular endothelial organ. It has uh, roles in our immune system, especially in the treatment and protection against encapsulated bacteria. Uh, moving over here to the pancreas, uh, this hamburger meat-like substance uh, here in the mid-abdomen, technically the retroperitoneum is going to be our pancreas over here. So remember, we always want to look at the pancreatic head, which is going to be more of a right-sided kind of midline structure just over um, our inferior vena cava and uh, around our superior mesenteric vein and artery. The pancreatic tail is going to stretch all the way to the left side of the body and lie just next to the splenic hilum. The liver over here, again, not showing you the entire liver on this one slide where I've denoted it, but this uh, blue circle over here is going to be this in our right-sided hemi-abdominal structure. Uh, in these lower ones where I talk about the gallbladder and adrenal, you can see a bit more of the liver. In fact, there's an abscess in the liver on this gallbladder image right over there. Um, moving over to our kidney and ureter, the kidney are going to be two paired retroperitoneal structures. Um, they're going to be by, behind uh, most of the abdominal organs, often surrounded by a layer of fat. Remember, the right kidney has a tendency to be a bit lower than the left kidney because the liver kind of pushes it down. Um, the gallbladder is going to be in the gallbladder fossa, a bit anterior, but underneath the liver on the right side of the body. In this particular case, it actually has stones in it. So you can see these heavily calcified stones inside of the gallbladder. The adrenal gland, I like to think of them as triangular wizard hats that sit on top and anterior to the kidneys. Again, these should be paired structures bilateral. Thickening of them or enlargement of them could represent an adrenal hyperplasia. At the same time, uh, masses or nodules inside of them could represent anything from adrenal adenomas to pheochromocytomas. And then the urinary bladder is going to be a lot lower in the pelvis in between the bones of the pelvis here, um, sometimes depending upon uh, how full it is will indicate how obvious it is. And then as we go down lower into the pelvis, we can see in image A over here, this is the rectum, the lowest part of our large intestine. Um, image B over here is gonna be our sigmoid colon. Again, it's predominantly a left-sided structure that will link the rectum at the midline back to the descending colon over to the left side of the hemiabdomen. C over here is our transverse colon. <laughs> Uh, as it crosses the midline of the body and quite anterior. And D over on the right hemiabdomen over here is going to be our ascending colon. Remember that the descending colon and ascending colon are retroperitoneal structures. The transverse colon is a intraperitoneal structure for all of you step one people out there who are uh, mastering anatomy for this test. Going a little higher here for some of our upper GI structures, the esophagus in image A here is going to be our air-filled kind of tubular structure at the lower portion of the chest. Realize that it's adjacent to and um, a very posterior structure, but next to the descending aorta and obviously posterior to the heart, okay? Sometimes in, in questions, um, you can be quite confused because sometimes you might get a, a question as simple as, uh, what is the more anterior structure? Is it the trachea or the esophagus? Okay, think about that for a moment. When's the last time you thought about something like that? And you would also realize that simply just by palpating your neck here, you would realize that the trachea is going to be the more hard to palpate and, and anterior structure relative to a, your esophagus. You can't exactly palpate your esophagus, but you can palpate your trachea. Um, B over here is going to be our stomach where the esophagus empties into. And then C, remember that the majority of our small bowel in the upper abdomen is going to be a right I'm sorry, a left-sided structure. The duodenum C-loop is going to come down, make that C-loop around the head of the pancreas. Ligament of trites is the junction point between the duodenum and the jejunum. And the jejunum is going to be predominantly left-sided small bowel with our ileum and distal jejunum filling most of our pelvis. And now let's jump back to some cases over here. Okay, we've got some chest 
issues, some, some abdominal issues coming up here. Um, this is a patient with tearing chest pain with a history of hypertension, um, pain that radiates to the back quite aggressively. Um, Annette, what are you seeing on this, on this slide here? So the first thing that sticks out to me is I look at the aorta and I see that there's something there that shouldn't be there. So there's almost like this hairpin structure, so dark structure that separates two parts. So basically I'm seeing an extra lumen, I'm seeing a false lumen. And in a patient who's presenting with extreme pain um, and a history of hypertension, or maybe a history of something else, maybe a connective tissue disorder like Marfan syndrome, the first thing I would think is aortic dissection and you guys all said it perfectly, amazing. Absolutely correct. This is an aortic dissection. We call this a dissection flap, okay? And the dissection flap separates what we call the true lumen of the aorta from the false lumen of the aorta. Remember that dissections typically will happen because of tears in the intima for whatever reason. So they can be related because of chronic hypertension or they can happen because of trauma, because of an acceleration, deceleration injury, say in people with car accidents. Um, this can result in intimal tears that because of blood pumping from the left ventricle can eventually extend that tear further and further down um, the descending aorta. This is going to be a type A or a type B dissection for our people taking step two. Silence in the chat. Oh, some mixed answers here. Type B versus type A. Annette, if you had to take a guess, would you have would you have any idea about how to grade this type A or type B? So, guys, if you look at like the the side, is it ascending or descending? Does that help us answer the question? Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Type A is ascending and type B is descending. That's a really great way to think about it. Yes, um, by definition, if we wanna get real technical with the anatomy, if the dissection happens distal to the left subclavian artery, it is by definition a type B or, a, uh, or an antegrade dissection. And if it's a type A, it has to happen going retrograde um, proximal to the uh, left subclavian artery and typically head back toward the aortic root. Do we remember how to manage these? Again, this is great review for our surgical shelf uh, students out there, as well as our step two CK students. Um, how is the management of a type A versus a type B dissection handled? Silence in the chat. Annette, do you have any guesses there? Um, how about you tell us, Fred? Sure, no problem. Remember that type A dissections are going to head backward toward the aortic root and have a tendency to potentially rupture into the uh, pericardium. They can cause severe life-threatening pericardial tamponade. These are going to be surgically managed. Type A dissections that go backward toward the heart need to be surgically managed. It's an operating room. But your type B dissection, which typically may happen as a result of chronic hypertension, as in this patient here, are managed medically, typically with beta blockers like labetalol. It's going to bring that blood pressure down, and that's going to help you uh, manage that dissection. Now, of course, dissections that continue to extend <laughs> or cause end organ damage, like if they extend into the renal arteries or they cause ischemia of the bowel, those become surgical emergencies because now the organs in the abdomen are injured. All right, this is in fact a type B dissection because it is happening in the descending aorta. Great job. All right, a little bit of a different aortic pathology here. We are looking at the lower abdomen here over on my right side. This. This little tip of gray is the liver tip, okay? I've got some loops of jejunum over on my left over here. And in the middle of my abdomen, I've got this giant eyeball winking at me for some reason. I can see contrast in the middle of this eyeball and around it is a darker attenuation of those X-ray beams that kind of extend uh, outside of here. Now, if I were to give you some history here, this is a, an older gentleman with a smoking history with a pulsatile abdominal mass hyperlipidemia, and they uh, are uh, currently complaining of abdominal pain, okay? What would be our differential here? 
wait for people to come in with the chat here. I'm seeing a lot of good answers here. This is in fact a triple A or an aortic aneurysm with merle thrombus, specifically an abdominal aortic aneurysm. We are in the abdomen here. This is not thoracic, okay? This is gonna be an abdominal aneurysm. I can see liver, I can see bowel. We have to be by definition in the abdomen for this. So this is aortic aneurysm with merle thrombus. It's quite large. The mural thrombus is around it. Mural means wall. So it's going to be old clot that's basically adherent to the wall here. And um, again, your triple your A patients are going to be, who, who's your biggest risk factor for getting a triple A versus a thoracic aortic aneurysm? Those are two different patient populations right there. Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of great answers here. So these are your smokers, your atherosclerotic patients are going to get your triple A's, your abdominal aortic aneurysms, your hypertensive patients, your coarctation of the aorta patients, your Marfan's patients are going to be the ones who get the thoracic aortic aneurysms. Good distinction to know between the two of them. Good job. All right. Um, now, here's an interesting case. Um, this is a abdominal CT scan that we're seeing kind of midway through the, the mid abdomen. Again, if you can make it out, I've got the liver over here on my left side, oops, that was my bad. Aorta over here on my, on my right side, uh, my bad, I, I misspoke. And I've got my spleen tip over here on the left, stomach over here, if you can make all this out. And the brightest things on my scan over here are calcified structures, like the vertebral body, my ribs over here. And for some reason, my aorta or the expected location of my aorta also seems to be the same attenuation as my bones. Now, this is a non-contrast exam. We have not given any contrast here because I'm not seeing the liver light up with contrast. I'm not seeing anything else light up with contrast. Just this one vessel, as well as all these calcified structures. <laughs> okay. This to me tells me that whatever is in this aorta is probably the same material that's making up these bones, which tells me that it's calcium. It's a high attenuating structure. Okay. This is aortic calcification. Okay. Uh, typically in something like this, you can see this very frequently in your atherosclerotic patients with chronic atherosclerosis, calcified plaques. Sometimes you might hear a radiologist call this like a coral reef appearance of the aorta. Again, advanced atherosclerosis, your biggest risk factors here are going to be a long smoking history. Okay. All right, uh, Annette, why don't you take us through this person in this, in this individual who has bloody stool, uh, but no abdominal pain. Okay, so the first thing that I do when I look here, because I see this structure here. Uh, so the way that I can tell where we are is based on our other structures. So we could tell that we're in the area of the pelvis. Uh, we can see some small bowel around here, and then we can see the structure that um, appears to be from the colon. And we also see some out pouches, so little grooves here that look like out pouching. Okay. Um, another thing you can hear in the vignette is maybe a history of constipation or a low fiber diet. Diverticulosis. And notice that it's diverticulosis and not diverticulitis. So the key in the vignette is that there is no pain. A patient with diverticulitis would have pain, and then there would also be some other inflammatory, maybe other image finding of like inflammation surrounding um, that sigmoid colon. Absolutely right. That is a, a, a brilliant way to look at this. And I, I love what you said specifically about the painless versus painful um, history here. Diverticulosis is a painless condition, but you're more likely to have bleeding diverticuli in painless diverticulosis and less likely to bleed in painful diverticulitis. Okay. Good associations of words to make. <laughs> While we're talking about that, Nanette, you kind of alluded to this. What are the features on imaging of diverticulitis if we were to compare the difference? Okay. So one thing that radiologists love to use is the word fat stranding. And anytime you see fat stranding in around a colon or even around any kind of like I guess organ, you, it's infl it means inflammation. So in my world, we see a lot of fat stranding in our IBD patients. Um, you could also see fat stranding around pancre uh, pancreas if you have acute pancreatitis. Um, and so that's that inflammation. So you'll hear that a lot, maybe not so much on the step, step one. It, um, it could be a buzzword on step two, 
Um, but definitely when you get into your training, you'll, you'll see a lot of that in your radiology leads. Absolutely. Here. Yeah. Uh, to, to comment on fat stranding, fat stranding, exactly as Annette said, is kind of this wispiness, this grayness that otherwise kind of disrupts what fat should look like and fat should be black. So um, one way to remember this kind of on the exam is a fat black cat. So cat being cat scan. So if you've got a CT scan, okay, black should be fat. So fat, fat black cat that kind of helps you remember what color normal fat should be on a CT scan. So when the fat begins to look a bit gray and strandy and vascular, this is literally just edema, which is water density, um, kind of seeping a little bit into that fat that's around it. And we know that water is more dense than fat and therefore it should be a brighter color on our CT scans compared to what fat should look like. So remember, CT scans and x-rays work on the principle of x-ray attenuation. The more dense something is, the more likely it is to block those x-rays or absorb them. And the denser something is, the brighter it looks on chest or on radiographs or on CT scans. So great job there, Annette. <laughs> Annette, here's another little one for you, something that you're probably very well versed with identifying in a neonatal ICU. Okay, this is a, a premature um, neonate um, who is not, not doing too hot. Okay, so the first thing that I notice is, well, we're looking at a KUV or an abdominal x-ray and we could see a lot of bowel, but there's something that's really standing out to me that's really concerning. Why am I seeing these rings? I see two rings. I get, so I see air here, and then I see almost like leakage into the air, like a little bit more air around it. That's not a normal bowel. That's not how a bowel should look like. And basically that is signifying that there's intramural um, gas in the bowel, intramural bowel gas, pretty much. And so the diagnosis here, especially in a pre, premature baby um, is pneumatosis intestinalis, which is basically telling us that this baby has neck, so necrotizing enterocolitis. Brilliant. Yes. Pneumatosis intestinalis is the definition or the word we would say for air in the wall. So excellent job with that finding there, but you're absolutely right in that necrotizing enterocolitis would be the ultimate diagnosis if, if we saw a premature newborn like this. And they usually present with poor feeding, some abdominal distension. Uh, they could have diarrhea, um, blood in the stools, and they could also present with full-blown sepsis. And because of the risk, high risk of sepsis, this is why this is very serious. Absolutely. Do we know how the air gets there, Annette? Uh, it's usually a lot just inflammation, and that constant inflammation creates basically a way for like the gas to go through. And it's a lot of the times it has to do with um, the bacteria in the bowel. Um, there's a lot of the, there's basically um, a mess up with the, the floor of the bacteria and that causes a lot of issues. Sure. So exactly in the sense that there's a vascular injury at some point because uh, newborns <laughs> have a hard time kind of oxygenating various organs for, for multiple, for one reason or another hypoxic injuries can happen in the brain for neonates in the form of germinal matrix hemorrhages, as well as in the bowel for something like necrotizing enterocolitis. And when you have a vascular insult to the bowel, basically you cause necrosis that allows for those bacteria, as Annette said, to translocate across the bowel wall and actually produce gas inside of the wall, which creates this pneumatosis intestinalis appearance. Um, Another interesting finding, and you've probably learned about it in your rotations if you're there, is that portal venous gas is another ominous sign of dead bowel or bacterial translocation because that air's got to go somewhere and the bowel we know drains blood to the liver via the portal vein. So portal venous gas, um, also another ominous sign and something that should raise suspicion for um, very uh, dead bowel or bacterial translocation across that, which can be a very, very uh, bad sign for infection. Over here, we've got a, uh, a CT scan with a big focus on the liver here. And I think that we would all agree that this liver is quite large. I usually think about the liver being a right-sided organ, but this liver is clearly crossing midline. And on top of that, uh, the liver just being giant, there's also these splotchy kind of cannonball-like structures that are darker than the regular enhancing liver. So they're not enhancing at the same time. And there's all these kind of nodules kind of all over the place. Um, 
you know, what would we think about in this kind of situation? Is this a differential diagnosis or, or what could we extrapolate from this? One of the things they love to ask about this is, is it a primary lesion or is it not? And they'll just show you an image like this and ask you if it's a primary lesion. Seeing a lot of really great answers here. A lot of people are saying that this looks like hepatic metastases um, uh, pattern. And I, I, I would agree. They're randomly distributed, okay? Randomly distributed kind of throughout the liver here. So definitely probably came from somewhere else. But there's another clue in the enhancement pattern. Now, again, this is quite advanced for, for where you would have to be as a medical student at this, at this phase of your career. But I can also tell that these tend to be metastases by how they are enhancing. Okay, um, primary liver tumors have a tendency to recruit blood supply from the hepatic arteries, which means they should be quite bright when it comes to an arterial enhancing um, scan. We are in the portal venous phase here, and these are certainly not bright. Doesn't mean that they can't be primary tumors, but they're randomly distributed, but they tend to not really enhance at all. Okay, this is pretty characteristic of metastases. So great job. Okay, now where's the primary tumor most likely located? Um, let's go ahead and, and see what we can do to answer these. I'm seeing a, a few good answers over here. Everybody responding correctly with colon being the primary source of these things. How did they get there? Why colon? Why are we so confident that these are colon cancer metastases? How did they get there? Good job, guys. Fantastic. They arrived there from the portal vein circulation from the bowel into the liver. Excellent job, everybody. Well done. <laughs> okay, here's a patient um, who's got a history of abdominal pain and a history of atrial fibrillation, okay? So atrial fibrillation, they have abdominal pain on their left side. Seeing an image here about midway through the abdomen, we've got our liver over here on the right. We've got our kidneys, uh, back medial structures that we can both appreciate. Our aorta sitting right on top of our vertebral body. Our IVC is over here. Uh, stomach also anterior and left side. And we've got our spleen, this triangular structure over to the left. And over on the left side here in the spleen, I can see kind of this wedge shaped area of hypoattenuation. Okay. That's toward the periphery of the spleen. Okay. Wedge shaped periphery and hypoattenuating. This is a contrast enhanced exam. I can see because my aorta and my IVC are lit up. I can see little splotches of portal vein that are also enhancing in here. So I know that this is a contrast enhanced CT scan. Uh, and I'm seeing a wedge shaped area of non enhancement toward the periphery of the spleen. I'm seeing a couple of really good answers over here. In a history of atrial fibrillation, this might make me want to think of a splenic infarct. Okay, remember that atrial fibrillation puts patients at really high risk for forming left atrial thrombi. Uh, these left atrial thrombi can break off and go systemic and cause end organ infarctions and ischemia um, in liver, in spleen and in kidneys. Now liver, a little unlikely, you can get infarcts in the liver from hepatic artery involvement, but we also know that the hepatic artery is not our main source of blood to the liver. What is the main source of blood to the liver? Hepatic artery only serves about 20 to 30% of hepatic blood flow. The remaining 70 to 80% comes from, correct, the portal vein. Excellent job. So this is a, a classic example, end organ infarction like spleen or kidneys, um, where you've got this wedge-shaped peripheral hypoattenuation, hypoenhancement of a solid organ. Those are the buzzwords you want to associate with that. Great job. They could also throw you a pediatric case and they could say, I a sickle cell anemia and show you this picture. And then they can ask you questions about sickle cell disease. So there's a lot of ways that they can present those symptoms for you. And then also they could test you on the different clotting factors like factor five, laden uh, mutation or pro protein C and S deficiency. Terrific job, absolutely great points in it. Sickle cell is a great one too. You know, in adults, when we see this, we almost say the spleen might not even be present or might be a very small calcified remnant in the left upper quadrant. Um, we call that splenic auto infarction. That is what happens. And we very frequently see it on CT scans of patients with sickle cell anemia. 
Annette, why don't you take us through this case? This history is some, uh, a gentleman with heavy alcohol use history, multiple hospitalizations, um, multiple repeated admissions to the hospital for abdominal pain. Okay, so we look at here, we can see that we see our kidneys, so we know we're in the abdomen. Um, and we can see a little bit of our liver. And then we look kind of, we can see bowel gap, like gas in the bowels. And then we see this round structure in the middle. And so we have to kind of figure out, okay, what is around here? And you could kind of see like, I think this one might be a little bit tricky to see, but you could tell, you know that the pancreas sits around this area. And mm -hmm. so this circular structure is on a structure that appears to be a pancreas. And with the history that we've been given, the vignette, we're, we're hearing chronic alcoholic, um, in, continuous insults, acute pancreatitis, lots of different type, like episodes of acute pancreatitis. So now you're thinking chronic pancreatitis and you want to look for a structure that looks like a pancreas. And then you see this um, circular cystic structure. Um, so what do you guys think it is? Good. Seen a few mixed answers. Certainly the right one is involved in there. So great job, everybody. Remember this, this thing right here that I'm outlining, hopefully everybody can see my mouse. This organ here, just anterior to the aorta and the IVC, but behind the bowel, again, a retroperitoneal structure is our pancreas. Okay. There's a pancreatic head. And Annette is described, has described quite beautifully this hypo attenuating, very round cystic structure that appears just anterior to the pancreatic head. And then, so a lot of you are saying an adenocarcinoma, and that's not a bad thought. But remember, cancer usually tends, if you're looking at cancer, it tends to be irregularly shaped. You're not going to see this, like, and correct me if I'm wrong, Fred, you're not going to see this, like, perfectly circular cystic shape. Usually, you won't see that. In cancer, uh, you're going to see a lot of disorganization. There's always exceptions to the rule, but that's not a bad thought. Um, I agree, especially in pancreatic cancer. If people are thinking pancreatic adenocarcinoma, remember, what do you know about the history of pancreatic, uh, pancreatic adenocarcinomas from your clinical vignettes, from all your studying? How does that usually present? Quite insidious, usually at the end stage, often underdiagnosed until the very, very end. And the imaging findings actually very much contribute to this. You know, pancreatic adenocarcinomas have a tendency to be very invasive, very irregular, often very occult. Um, tumors that are very much uh, insinuated within the pancreatic head or the tail, depending upon where they want to form. Um, certainly that recurrent bouts of chronic pancreatitis certainly predisposes somebody for um, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Of course, there's always a huge association risk with smoking history with pancreatic cancer. But in this patient with multiple hospitalizations with a history of heavy alcohol use, um, and recurrent bouts of acute pancreatitis, one of the more common uh, sequela of that history is going to be a pancreatic pseudocyst. So excellent job describing the findings there, Annette. Great job for everybody who got that question right. Keep in mind your, um, your, your clinical vignettes and your history. Remember, if I was thinking pancreatic adenocarcinoma, I might think that somebody has is a bit older in age, okay? Somebody in the, in the realm of maybe 50 plus years old, certainly 60 to 70 is a great age range to think of somebody with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. History of smoking is a great one to have or just kind of an incidental history uh, simply um, alone. Uh, th these can happen sporadically. Um, Painless jaundice is a great way to present with pancreatic adenocarcinoma of the head, but if this person didn't have any other kind of systemic symptoms, a great symptom to look out for would be kind of just nonspecific depression, fatigue, loss of interest in things, really no motivation to kind of get out of the bed in the morning, and just a general tiredness and weight loss of an undisclosed source or just really no no etiology to ascribe to it. Okay. That's going to be kind of your more classic pancreatic adenocarcinoma vignette for the USMLE exams. Someone with a heavy alcohol history with a pancreatic um, pancreatitis history that kind of happens over and over and over again, you're going to think that maybe pseudocyst is going to be a more common sequela of that individual. Great job, everyone. Pancreatic pseudocyst. All right. Annette, why don't you take us through this CT scan? Okay. So we know we're also at the level of the kidneys because we can see the kidneys. But right away, the thing that stands out to me is that these kidneys are not normally shaped. And then I see these 
like the structure right bilaterally right next to my structure uh, next to my kidneys that is huge and i know that that doesn't belong there so what kind of um vignette would you see with this maybe um in my world in pediatrics maybe a young baby presenting with recurrent utis Fantastic. Uh, Annette, in fact, that's a that's a really great sequela, especially for our pediatric students out there preparing for their shelf exams or their step two. Um, if this was a young a patient, particularly a baby, and they had uh, this finding here, uh, what maybe uh, what gender would you assume them to be? I know we should never really assume gender nowadays, but at least when it comes to external genitalia and things like that, one particular gender has a predisposition for this finding. Seeing a lot of people saying male babies here and the indication being posterior urethral valves, that is a great, great differential diagnosis there for a, a young baby who does not have a lot of urine output, bilateral hydronephrosis, that is what Annette is describing here. So ginormous renal collecting systems. The kidney here is a bit splayed outward. It's kind of dilated. The cortex is beginning to get a little thinned because of the increased pressures in the renal collecting system. Posterior urethral valves, if this was a young child, a young male child is a great thing to have on your radar. <coughs> but based on the CT scan, this is definitely not a baby. I think we can all agree about that, right? This is a an older patient, okay? And Annette, you made a great observation saying that this is a bilateral finding. So both kidneys are being affected here. What kind of history would our, would our listeners assume this to be related to bilateral hydronephrosis, hydroureteronephrosis? There we go, we got, the readers got it right. Um, so the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I love, I love prostate being thrown. So yes, a, a, a prostate obstruction, whether that be BPH um, is, is a great one. Remember prostate cancer. Okay. Less likely to obstruct. Okay. Less likely to have those urinary symptoms with prostate cancer. Why is that? Because prostate cancer has a tendency to form in the transitional zone, which is a peripheral zone of the prostate gland, not a periurethral zone. Periurethral hyperplasia or BPH, which is where you frequently see that, is more likely to plague men with an inevitable fate of uh, urinary obstruction as they get older in age. So um, while prostate cancer can absolutely obstruct, um, we think about BPH being a more common cause of, of urethral obstruction. What if this was a female patient with bilateral hydroureteronephrosis? What kind of differential diagnosis would you might wanna think about? Pregnancy is one of them. Did you have an obstruction? Absolutely correct. A, a, uh, uterine or a gynecologic malignancy would be a great reason to have a bilateral ureteral obstruction. Absolutely correct. Uterine mass, invasive cervical cancer. Um, absolutely correct. Very, very good. Other patients you might want to also consider is people who were treated for cancer, right? If they got radiation to their retroperitoneal lymph nodes or any kind of, of pelvic cancer, radiation can cause fibrosis as well as um, ureteral stricturing. Uh, because of that inflammation that happens as a result of the radiation therapy and can cause ureteral obstructions. And surgical management, you can have an error with the surgery or you can have adhesions form and that can cause obstruction as well. And more common, and maybe you wouldn't see it bilaterally, but unilaterally, if you have a, a, a kidney, kidney stone, you can see some of that. Maybe not this severe, but unilateral, um, you can potentially see it. Absolutely. So unilateral hydronephrosis and obstructing stone is a great thing to keep in mind. So well done there. Good. Thank you for mentioning that. Perfect. Good job, everybody who, who submitted answers. You were spot on with it. So this is the coronal view of our CT abdomen and pelvis here. What we're looking at is uh, as if Annette and I were having a conversation as we are now, I'm looking straight at Annette's face. And if I was looking at her abdomen, this is what I would be seeing on a coronal view here. So again, our directionality has not changed. Our liver is still up here in our right upper quadrant. Our spleen still in our left upper quadrant. Pancreas more midline in the retroperitoneum. The portal vein kind of goes into the liver. And you can see quite nicely here how the mesenteric veins are draining into the portal vein, into the liver. The gallbladder, as I said, a right upper quadrant structure that is uh, just underneath the liver and the gallbladder fossa. 
um, hepatic flexure of the ascending colon, the ascending colon down here, and then bowel occupy, small bowel occupying most of the pelvis. That's going to be distal jejunum and ilium. And then left upper quadrant small bowel has a tendency to be jejunum, very fourth portion of the duodenum, if you see it there. Urinary bladder very low in the pelvis adjacent to the pubic bones. CT of the chest, a little bit more detail here. Okay, I've got in my upper um, image left uh, picture here. I have to make that perfectly clear. <laughs> um, my red dots here are the branches of my aortic arch as illustrated in this uh, red lettering. My blue structure here is going to be left brachiocephalic vein crossing over the midline, draining into the SVC. My trachea is going to be this air-filled blue dot over here, my esophagus uh, or oesophagus if you are in England or anywhere else in the empire or commonwealth is going to be this yellow dot over here to the left of it. My right lung and my left lung are going to be these black structures filled with air on both sides. Um, looking a little bit lower, we can see the pulmonary trunk in this middle top image branching into the right and left main pulmonary arteries. The ascending aorta is going to be an anterior right-sided origin, ultimately to have its course on the posterior left side of the body as it crosses over from the arch. A little bit lower here into the four chambers of the heart, the right atrium is going to be a uh, right-sided, more anterior structure. The left atrium is going to be a posterior structure. The left ventricle, a left-sided posterior structure, and the right ventricle, the most anterior chamber of the heart in the chest. Oftentimes you may be asked that patients with traumatic stab wounds on your, on your step exams, which ventricle is most like, or which chamber of the heart is most likely to be injured from a penetrating stab injury to the chest. The answer is gonna be your right ventricle because it lies the most anterior in the chest. And your most posterior chamber is your left atrium. So always keep that in mind as well. Um, coronal here, this is our descending aorta in our image left uh, picture here as it courses along the spine. This is our trachea over here uh, in the middle bottom image. And then this is our heart chamber in our image right lower picture right over here where my mouse is hovering, okay? We've got another case here looking at some chest problems. Uh, Annette, why don't you take us through what you see? Okay, so first thing I noticed is the heart right in the middle and one thing that you already talked about, Fred, is whenever you look at the heart, you should not see a big, you, you should just barely see the pericardium of the heart, just like a very thin surrounding. So I already see a layer of, of something collecting around this heart that's not normal. And then I also see some fluid accumulation over here. So probably a pleural effusion of some sort. Um, and so this patient would probably present with what we call a Beck triad. So with some hypotension, distended neck veins, distant heart sounds. Good job, guys. Cardiac tamponade, pericardial effusion. Now I'll say over here, and uh, some people are calling it out pretty well, um, we can't diagnose cardiac tamponade on imaging alone, remember tamponade is a really a clinical diagnosis just as well as it can correlate with any imaging findings that being through a CT scan, or maybe we've got an echo report that can tell us that there's a large finding in the pericardium. But the finding that we're gonna indicate here is gonna be a pericardial effusion. Now, Annette gave us a good clinical history here of somebody with shortness of breath, distended neck veins, distant heart sounds. This is the Beck's triad of cardiac tamponade. Again, notice how the cardiac tamponade Beck's triad are all clinical physical exam findings, none of which actually have to do with any imaging here. But if you see those clinical findings combined with the imaging finding of a pericardial effusion, you can therefore call this the cardiac tamponade. So awesome job. There is also, yes, a small left pleural effusion. And this hyper attenuating structure over here is atelectatic lung. So there you go. It's being pushed on by the effusion. This is a compressive atelectasis process. Great job, everybody. Here we're showing you the lung windows, okay? You can change the grayscale on your imaging in CT scans to basically help you see different um, structures here. And without going too much into the weeds, you can change the windowing and the leveling of the various uh, uh, parameters on your CT scans to bring out 
structures of different densities. Sometimes those densities can be that which are related to contrast enhanced structures versus bones versus soft tissue versus fluid density versus air density. And our lung window is a great window to help us to take a look at the lung density and the lung parenchyma themselves. What we're seeing here is the darkest areas are gonna be our alveolar air spaces. Our bright linear structures here are going to be our pulmonary vasculature and our donuts that we can see here, which are our bright circles with dark interiors are our bronchi and our airways. So looking at a few lung cases here in the lung window, this is a young patient who has a immune compromised history with recurrent pneumonias and lung infections, okay? Think about this for a little bit here. Our imaging findings suggest um, that we've got air spaces over here. So this is the lung parenchyma. The alveoli look pretty good with the exception maybe of our, of our right side of the, of the lower lobe here. Okay, there's some areas of ground glass. This is a CT lung finding that radiologists like to say a lot. And it basically just means that there's some issues going on with the interstitium of the lung um, of some haziness there. There's also some areas of consolidation that we can see over here as well, maybe fluid involving the alveolar spaces themselves. But the thing that is really um, sticking out to me, okay, is the fact that I'm seeing a lot of what I described before as airways. So my, my Cheerios or my donuts here that are bright with little dark circles inside of them. Okay, I'm seeing way too big airways that are extending out all the way to the periphery of my lungs. These airways are far too large to be this peripheral. This is not okay. And in somebody with an immune compromised history with multiple pneumonias, recurrent lung infections, okay, this is a classic finding of bronchiectasis. Okay, bronchiectasis being bronchi from the etiology of our airway word here, and then ectasis or ectasis or ectasia, stretched out, stretched out bronchi. That is what bronchiectasis means, okay? Lots of things cause bronchiectasis, recurrent airway infections being a really great etiology, but there's a few diseases and a few differentials you wanna have in mind for your step prep um, that are going to present like this. What's a good differential diagnosis in that for somebody with bronchiectasis? Cystic fibrosis, absolutely. That's probably the number one most likely thing to be asked with somebody with bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, a mutation in the CFTR gene, which is a chloride transporter, inability to get those secretions wet enough to be coughed out. So they stick around, they trap bacteria inside of the airways, they cause um, bronchiectasis because you basically are just damaging the airway wall over and over again. They get inflamed, they get infected, they get weaker, they get stretched out. You can also have other types of bronchiectasis where there's um, some degree of pulling of these airways open in, in pulmonary fibrotic um, diseases. That's a little bit less common than your CF diagnoses. What's another good immune deficiency one uh, where you really can't clear your airways of infections? Sometimes these patients may appear with organs on the wrong side of their body. Cartagineers, good job. Or any Cart kind of... Primary yeah. ciliary dyskinesia. Primary ciliary dyskinesia. Very, very good. Um, Cartagener syndrome, bronchiectasis is a common finding here, and situs inversus, basically a heterotaxy syndrome where you wind up with your right-sided organs on your left side and your left-sided organs on your right side. And the great thing about this is that the USMLE can take this image and then give you a third or fourth order question on Cartagener's or cystic fibrosis. Um, and they love to do that. And for our step two students out there, uh, in keeping with that idea of third and fourth order questions, what kind of bacterial culture isolate would you expect a patient with cystic fibrosis to cough up with a CT scan like this? I'm seeing pseudomonal coverage and those people who are getting ready to take their step two or maybe even past step two, what kind of antibiotics do we need to cover these people with when they are admitted to the hospital? CT scan looking at this, pseudomonal coverage. I'm seeing piperacillin tazobactam. Remember they come as a combo, piperacillin tazobactam, very good. Also known as Zosin if you're thinking about brand names. Other anti-pseudomonal antibiotics, what's another good one to know? Cefepime, excellent job. Cefepime is a great one. Great job, everybody. <laughs> All right, here's another patient. Annette, describe this for us. So, of course, 
you can tell there's a bunch of tiny lesions, lots of little lesions all over the place. And so the vignette is important for this because there's several things that can cause um, an image to look like this. But what in this vignette, let's say they're um, having fevers for a long time, chronic fevers, there's night sweats, uh, maybe it's, there's a history of poorly um, controlled HIV, CD count very low. Good job, very TV. So the important part is it's not just, they're not just presenting with TB symptoms, they're also immunocompromised. So this is miliary TB. And in order for you to get TB this severe, you have to be immunocompromised. And a lot of the times it's, they've had a history of the TB and then um, it gets reactivated uh, when, when they're in an immunocompromised state. Absolutely correct. Could this be anything else? Maybe with a different history, same image, different history. Good. Let's say, let's say this person was not uh, immune compromised at all. In fact, they had no real significant past medical history and you saw this finding. I suppose disseminated fungal infection could certainly have an appearance like this, but disseminated fungal infection doesn't just happen in somebody walking around the streets. Oh, I love that. Metastatic disease. Absolutely. This could be pulmonary metastases in a miliary metastatic pattern. We can actually use that description because of coming from TB to describe certain types of miliary nodule like pattern like this. They typically spread via hematogenous spread to the lungs that look like this. They're in a miliary pattern. Anybody want to guess at where the primary might come from that looks like this? not prostate. Prostate rarely goes to lung. It can, but it's... Kidneys on a bad thought. Thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer is going to be the one that actually has a miliary pattern on, on this kind of thing. Beyond what you guys would have to know for the step, but sometimes these things are kind of fun to have in the back of your pocket. All right. Here's another one here. We've got a, um, a patient who has a recent travel history, past positive PPD, now with fever, cough, and weight loss, night sweats. Giving you all the buzzwords here. On the imaging findings here, I see this kind of nodular pattern, very similar as to what we saw. We're in the upper lobes of the lung, I can tell you that. And then we've got this consolidation that's along the fissure, a big kind of thickened rind around basically a big cavity, if I will describe it as that. This is a, an, active, an active TB infection with a cavitary lesion. Tuberculosis is a great answer here. Good job. And then one step further, here's another cavitary-like lesion, but this time it's full of something, okay? This is a patient with a history of sarcoidosis who is now coughing up blood. Annette, what do you think? Aspergilloma. Aspergilloma is a great answer here. This is a fungal ball that has decided to colonize inside of a prior TB cavity as if you couldn't add enough insult to injury. And I think also <laughs> the key word was the sarcoidosis because it kind of creates um, like an immunocompromised state. So not an, a normal person tends to, someone with a normal um, immune system tends to not um, get infections with aspergillus. We see that a lot in immunocompromised um, patients. In my world, we see it a lot of um, aspergillus in um, our hemoc kiddos who are severely immunocompromised. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I'll have you take this case. This person was in a, they presented to the emergency room after they were rear-ended in a high speed motor vehicle collision, their O2 sat is 94%. They've got chest soreness. So I will look at our one with the contrast on the right, just cause that one is, you could see a lot. I'm sorry, on my right. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oops. So this is, our, this is our long window image over here of the chest, yeah. yes. And so you could see, so in um, this kind of image, blood comes out 
light, right? So that's what we're looking for is blood. And so here we could see um, in this, the corner, so this is the patient's left lung, you could see that there's some kind of opacification. Um, and there's also like a line where that's kind of um, separating a little bit with a little bit of uh, consolidation. But then you could also look at the chest wall and you can see that the chest wall di diameter is also thicker than the opposite side. So it looks like there's probably some kind of chest trauma that had occurred. And then there's seeping of blood into the lung is what I'm saying. Sure. Now, I will say that we really can't tell the difference between, um, you know, uh, blood versus fluid versus something in an airspace. But I do agree with you that there is something that is causing a consolidation here in the airspaces themselves. It's kind of this, this density that is mixing in with airspaces that is quite dark. So we know that this is like an alveolar process. Okay. And Annette, you, you brought up a great point of drawing attention to the chest wall here. This is air within the chest wall, these dark speckles over here. And the air within the chest wall is acutely adjacent to whatever this consolidation that is happening here in the lingula of the lung on the left side. Um, what would you say that this is, Annette? This would be a pulmonary contusion. This is a pulmonary contusion. I see a lot of people throwing hemothorax around. That is incorrect. Hemothorax specifically is blood within the pleural space. Okay. Pulmonary contusion, on the other hand, is a bruise of the lung. This is just a bruised lung. Bruises bleed into themselves. In this case, the alveoli are full of blood from a traumatic injury. You know that because there is also air within the chest wall over here. And also, Fred, correct me if I'm wrong. If a patient is sitting and laying supine and then they have a hemothorax, that blood is going to pull towards gravity. So it should be um, posterior. Ideally, yes. Um, every once in a while, especially if it's a chronic pleural effusion or a chronic hemothorax, you can also have um, things become loculated where they kind of stay in anti-dependent portions of the chest, no matter which way the patient goes. But yes, for acute fluid in the pleural space, you're 100% correct in that it should go to the dependent portions wherever that patient is. Another important point to note about the pulmonary contusions, the initial chest x-ray, if it's right after the trauma, may actually be negative. This could be a finding maybe a little bit, a few hours later, six hours, 12 hours, and then um, they resolve pretty rapidly, maybe two or three days, this should be completely healed. Absolutely, great point. All right, here we go. We've got another um, image over here. This is a patient with chest pain. They've got an echo uh, and an EKG that is consistent with right ventricular strain, and they appear to the ED as tachycardic and tachypnic. What are we thinking over here? I see a lot of early correct answers coming through. As we say in radiology, sometimes these things are ant minis. You know these things like your ant mini. Classic finding. Yes, I'm seeing a lot of pulmonary emboli here. That is absolutely correct. Specifically, a saddle pulmonary embolism, meaning that it has straddled or, or been like a, a horse saddle, uh, uh, basically at the pulmonary artery bifurcation here. So this, la this filling defect here, this linear filling defect is thrombus that has embolized from some place, uh, most likely the upper or lower extremity. Um, has kind of wedged itself at the bifurcation of the left and right pulmonary artery. And we are seeing, seeing this filling defect on this contrast enhanced CT scan. It fits with the history. Absolutely well done. Good. Okay. Um, Annette, um, take us through this. This is a patient on hemodialysis, but they've missed their last two appointments. They've got chest pain and shortness of breath. Looks kind of familiar in a different image. So we are seeing this ground glass opacity that's surrounding um, the mediastinum and almost looks like a bat shape again. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't see any pleural effusions because the costophrenic angles are clear, um, but it does seem very congested. Um, it seems like uh, there's not a lot of air um, getting through and circulating through the hole. So I would, any guesses? Let's think about the history here. 
So this is a patient who's missed their last two hemodialysis appointments and they've got shortness of breath. And they don't want to lay down because it's very uncomfortable. A lot of, lot of different varieties of answer here. This will be a good discussion case for us in it. So I'm seeing a lot of people say ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, why, why would this not really be a history that coincides super well with ARDS? So why would a patient who missed dialysis get ARDS? So a lot of the times we're seeing ARDS following other kinds of insults. So we, okay, you're remix. Okay, so you can see with pancreatitis, right? ARDS following that, or maybe a, um, uh, like an, a premature infant, but not really just missing the dialysis. See, I'm seeing a lot of people with uh, suggesting congestive heart failure. Did we give anything in the history to suggest that they have CHF? Now, the imaging finding of what we're seeing here is absolutely something that we can find in CHF. But remember what we said before, CHF is a clinical diagnosis, not an imaging diagnosis. We can correlate imaging findings with clinical findings to come up with a diagnosis of CHF, but we cannot call CHF on an image alone. So why don't we go back to like dialysis? What is dialysis? What does it do? It clears our body of, of course, um, like it functions as a kidney, but it also it helps us clear like a um, fluid. That's like a, a really huge part of dialysis. So if you have a patient who is going days without dialysis, I mean, you're going to have electrolyte impulse, but you're also going to be super fluid overloaded. So think about if you, especially for end stage renal disease where you can't urinate at all, think about how much fluid is accumulating and where is that fluid going to go there? You're going to see their extremities extremely edematous. And if it's, if you're seeing, a, um, like pitting edema and things like that, um, you can expect that the fluid is going to go in other places, not just the, um, the, the outside of like the vessels and into the interstitium. Absolutely correct. I'm seeing a lot of good answers here for pulmonary edema. That is exactly what we're seeing here. Again, congestion, pulmonary congestion. I'm seeing a lot of thickening of the fissures, the ground glasses in it described, the cephalization and the engorgement of those pulmonary veins toward the upper and lower lung zones. Uh, and mediastinal haziness, meaning that there's some alveolar component of this pulmonary edema, this leaky fluid that's going in there. Dialysis is a great reason to get uh, pulmonary edema because as Annette said, you become volume overloaded because you don't have a kidney or you're missing dialysis appointments to be able to take that excess fluid off of the body. And that fluid's gotta go somewhere. So it's gonna be in the limbs, in the third space, in the interstitium, as well as the lungs count as that space as well. Great job just had a patient and a pediatric patient um, who presented with pulmonary edema. And this patient was, had pulmonary edema because they had so many um, medications. There were four different antimicrobials and they were getting fluids because they were NPO. And so no matter how much furosemide we gave, no matter how much diuretics we gave, we were still giving this patient way too much fluid. And of course we had to, because there was an, an like a major infection that, that we had to treat this patient with. But as a result, this patient developed pulmonary edema, which we saw every day on the chest x-ray, and this patient required oxygen supplementation. That's crazy. <laughs> All right, we've got our next image here. We've got uh, this patient who has a stab wound. Okay, so trauma patient coming in, I'm seeing bilateral pleural effusions dependent in nature. So it must be somewhat acute with some adjacent atelectasis over here. Um, I can tell you that these effusions are a bit high density from what I would expect um, normal fluid to look like. It almost matches the density of my adjacent muscle over here. In a trauma patient, this is what I would consider to be a hemothorax. If you look extremely closely here, you might even be able to hallucinate with me that more dense material is laying even more dependent. This is the layering of these blood products where the heavier blood products are going to sink to the bottom like our hemoglobin containing compounds um, and actually increase the attenuation of some of that fluid versus the less dense stuff that may float to the top. 
Rounding off our session today, we're going to go into the head and we're going to think about the things that we can see on our head CT. Remember that blood is bad, but it's not in a vessel. Typically, intracranial bleeding is going to be something very frequently shown to you all on your step exam. So we'll go through that as well. So blood can be timed. We can actually figure out how old blood can be inside the brain. If it's acute, it's going to be hyperdense, which is going to be our image left over here. Uh, you can see this crescentic subdural hematoma that is quite bright in nature. Now, this is not a contrast enhanced exam at all. This is just acute blood clot. I think about it as jellified or jello liquid metal, right? Because blood is essentially liquid metal. It's got a ton of iron and zinc and copper and all these other different types of metal in it. When it forms a blood clot, it's becoming a solid form of that liquid metal, which gives it the right to be incredibly dense. Blood clots that are acute have a tendency to be quite dense. <laughs> Subacute is what we call blood that is one to two weeks after the insult. And you'll see that it's basically the same density as the rest of the brain. Okay. And then chronic is going to be more than two weeks uh, to four weeks in duration. These are not the same patient, but on this other side, you can see that it takes to takes on a more water density in the brain. Again, this is a chronic subdural hematoma that is more CSF density. And you know that because you can compare it to the CSF, which is basically water inside of the ventricles. Okay. So blood locations, um, good to be familiar with the words about how these are described both on the wards and on the boards. So subdural is going to be um, in this crescentic location over here. It has a tendency to be able to be um, crossing of the midline because the subdural component is not bound by the, the sutures. That's something that we typically say in... Um, in radiology over here, whereas your epidural hematomas are going to be more like your lemon shaped, okay, or your biconvex shaped hematomas over here. These will not cross sutures because epidural, they are bound by the suture lines in the skull. So they will rarely or ev if ever cross midline. Intraventricular hemorrhages um, are going to be inside of the ventricles, obviously. So knowing your ventricular anatomy will be helpful to find that blood. Intraparenchymal is going to be within the actual meat of the brain, okay. And then your subarachnoid hemorrhages typically have fill the cisterns. So these are going to be the star pattern of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. So let's think about some etiologies that might happen or, or could cause various um, clinical vignettes or various etiologies for these different types of bleeding locations. Subdural hematomas. And now, where do you who do you expect to, to, to see with a subdural hematoma? Usually an elderly patient um, who maybe with a history of dementia. Um, maybe has fallen a lot in the past. You could see that. Um, you could also see it in abuse cases in pediatrics. Mm -hmm. uh, secondary to like shaking baby syndrome. Absolutely yeah. correct. And if you've got an older person with a subdural hematoma, what do you expect their presentation to be like? It's going to be more of a chronic. So you could also tell it's chronic just by looking at that, that that's like a, like we saw before, darker bleed. Um, usually they'll present with maybe memory loss, changes in their personality over time. And this is a chronic bleed. So this could be maybe six weeks after um, a fall that resulted in this subdural. Uh, That's great. So grandma who falls a lot and takes, uh, you know, a Pixaban for her AFib, who starts acting a little loose, loopy or maybe somnolent about a week after uh, a recent fall, a subdural is a great um, differential to have on your radar. An epidural hematoma are your skiers who wind up hitting into tree branches during their way down the mountain. And um, the classic vignette here is the person who has the lucid interval. So who has a moment of unconsciousness and then wakes up as if everything's fine, gets back on the slope and then gradually declines thereafter. Um, the classic vignette here is an injury to the middle meningeal artery, which is a branch off of one of the terminal um, arteries in the face, the external carotid artery. And um, these are your lemon shaped ones, as I had said before, mass effect, herniation, quite common with these. And these are, are more acute and fast onset injuries. Okay, this is an arterial bleed versus subdural, which is more of a venous bleed. Intraventricular hemorrhages can happen for a multitude of reasons. Annette, what are, what are some of the differentials that could cause an intraventricular bleed? Well, I actually have one today in ICU. Uh -huh. um, in ECMO patient, which for USMLA is not important for you all. Uh, but in pediatrics, we see it a lot in premature infants. Um, so the basically the vessels are extremely fragile and um, premature infants are a very high risk of having intraventricular bleeds. 
That's exactly right. In your older patient populations, you can consider an aneurysm rupture to be a great cause for intraventricular blood, as well as spread from blood from a hypertensive hemorrhage is another great reason to have spread into the ventricles. On that same topic, an intraparenchymal bleed, especially something in the corona radiata, or more importantly, the basal ganglia or thalamus or cerebellum, Intraparenchymal bleeds in those three locations are very consistent with hypertensive hemorrhages. So patients with rupture of those tiny little lenticulostriate arteries that happen as a result of hypertension or acute cocaine use, you can see these intraparenchymal hematomas here. And subarachnoid hemorrhages, the first thing that comes to mind for me is a ruptured aneurysm in the brain. That's going to be a really great reason to have a subarachnoid bleed. And that one presents worst headache of my life. Worst headache of life. Yes, those, those meninges are quite sensitive to, to pain. Here's some cisternal anatomy. I don't think this is particularly super high yield for the step exam, so I'm not going to talk ad nauseum about this. Just realize that the different CSF spaces in the brain all have names. When you become a radiologist like myself or a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, um, you will be very well acquainted <laughs> with these cisterns. <laughs> If face cisterns is a great indicator of increased intracranial pressure. Notice how we've lost our CSF spaces here. We don't have any of these CSF spaces that are filled here. Um, this is a great appearance of someone who has increased intracranial pressure. There's basically brain swelling. This is in particular brain edema. We've also lost the ability to tell the difference between our gyri and our sulci inside the brain. It all just looks like one big gray mush. And I'll compare it to some normal, look well, none of these are normal looking brains, but you can see that we should be able to see sulci and gyri that interweave as well as ventricles, as well as cisternal spaces. Um, this patient over here, not really seeing much of those CSF spaces, nor gyri, nor sulci. It's all one shade of gray. This is a consistent with a cerebral edema-like pattern, therefore causing increased intracranial pressure. You might want to consider this or link this in your mind with um, uh, hypoxic ischemic brain injury, okay? So someone who's coming in from the field, unknown amount of time that they have been found down. CPR was attempted, but they, they're still doing it. This is kind of your, your cerebral edema-like pattern, okay? Brain parenchyma over here, this is the gray stuff, what our brains are made out of. We're looking for asymmetry, midline shift, gray-white junctions. Here's an example of an asymmetry versus a midline shift. In the asymmetry, clearly one of the hemispheres of the brain is very abnormal compared to the other side. This could be from a multitude of reasons. In this particular area, this is probably a very large MCA distribution infarct. Okay, And versus the midline shift where there's something causing a mass effect that is pushing the midline structures to the other side. Hydrocephalus is an example of um, basically either too much CSF production or too little CSF drainage from an obstruction that is causing enlargement of the ventricles, the lateral third and fourth ventricles, as well as the cerebral aqueduct. Good pattern to have memorized for the exam. Okay. Some bony findings over here. This is what your facial bones will look like. We're also seeing the orbits quite nicely over here, as well as our extraocular muscles with our optic nerves in the middle of our um, orbits here. Um, great, you know, CT face findings can be very helpful for trauma radiologists to find fractures of the face um, as well. And MRIs are probably going to be the least common uh, modality that you find on the step exams. I don't want you all to worry about too much about MRI findings, but there are a couple of things that should, again, be ant minis for you on your step exam. And I've got two really high yield examples here. Over to image left, I've got a sagittal projection of the brain here, and we're seeing these bright um, finger-like projections, if you will, coming off of the midline structure here off the corpus callosum. Um, this is an ant mini or a classic finding for what disease, everybody? I'm seeing it in the chat. Great job. This is multiple sclerosis. They call these Dawson fingers. They are adjacent to the corpus callosum. Uh, this is a classic finding for multiple sclerosis, Dawson fingers. This is areas of demyelinating plaque inside of the brain. And then this finding on image right over here, I've got a sagittal image of my spine. I'm looking at the lower lumbar and the upper sacral spine over here, and I see this, this um, mass lesion, okay, this, this uh, 
this thing that should not be here, okay? And we're seeing that it is very intimately associated with the intervertebral disc at the L5 S1 junction. If this person had pain that radiated down their leg on one side and had like a sciatica distribution, you could call this a disc herniation. That is a great um, kind of ant mini for the exam, uh, classic finding for, for a clinical exam with a great MRI correlate. So yes, disc herniation would be the right answer. Okay, great job. Again, in Med School Tutors and Blueprint, before we move to our dedicated Q&A, we're here for your support. If you thought any of what we talked about in our webinar today was particularly helpful or high yield, we are happy to talk to you about study strategies and advice when it comes to taking the exam, succeeding in medical school and residency, and really just providing advice. Again, you guys are all fighting the good fight. You're all going to be wonderful doctors at some point in your lives, um, certainly very soon. If we can do that and talk to you and give advice as your colleagues, that is who we are. We hope that you consult us in the hospital, ask us questions. And if that means that we get to work together beforehand to prepare you for our exams, um, then we are here to do that. So please reach out to uh, Blueprint Med School Tutors at blueprintprep.com or call this number. We can talk to you for free and schedule a consult and hopefully hook you up with the right resource that you may need for um, your advice. Before we um, end our webinar in classic MST Blueprint fashion, we are here for a live Q&A. If there wasn't anything that was particularly clear, if you have questions about radiology on the exam or how we can help with that, or just specific clinical questions, things that didn't make sense, anything about the step exams or, or question clarification, please feel free to just type it in the chat below. We are here to answer your questions in real time and we'll stay for some time as well. Annette and I are happy to take on your questions right now and answer them absolutely live right here ask us anything. While we're waiting for some questions to roll in and at any, um, any pieces of advice or anything that you found particularly helpful when studying for radiology for the, for the uh, step exams, and maybe both step one, step two, step three, how it might present over time. Yes, actually, what I used to do, and I still do, it's actually studying for, um, for my pediatric boards, which are coming up. Um, I created Anki cards. So whenever I got a URL question or maybe a question from another QBank, I would actually screenshot that image and I would put it into an inky deck and I would review those images. And I would have the picture and maybe, and always with a vignette because I felt like that was the best way to really learn the radiology images and then have um, just an answer on the back of the car that, that not only says the diagnosis, but a couple important high yield facts um, with that as well. I do that with um, not only radiological images, but also pathologic, like pathology, histology images, and um, especially on the pediatric boards. So this is useful for step two, um, the derm questions and different rashes um, and lesions that you can see. Really good advice. I like the idea of making a very focused deck with, with high yield radiology for it. Of course, trying to do something like that for a radiology board exam can be a bit much. Uh, <laughs> there's just too much to cover. <laughs> Here's a great question coming in. You mentioned that miliary pattern metastases to the lungs associated with thyroid cancer. Which one specifically? That's a great question. I believe the most common one that we see it in is medullary thyroid, but that's beyond the scope of anything um, that you would need to worry about for the exam. They would not ask you that on a USMLE step question. That is a question for a radiology board exam resident or fellow becoming board certified in radiology. That is quite advanced. Any other questions? And it could be related to step prep as well. Really anything, anything on your minds. I liked what Annette said before, you know, they really don't expect you to be a radiologist on the steps. Usually, you know, when it comes to the vignettes, everything you really need to know can be answered from understanding that clinical question in the STEM. If you are good at the radiology imaging component of your practice questions and just recognizing some findings on imaging, then you are an advantage because oftentimes that x-ray or that CT scan on the exam question can basically just confirm the diagnosis for you. So if you recognize the findings that we've demonstrated for you here today, um, you can rest assured that you can basically confirm what the vignette was telling you and, and pick the right answer with confidence. So age versus what sort of chest x-ray might be seen. That's a bit of a broad question. Remember, patients of any age can really have any kind of 
answered. Pulmonary edema, metastases, things like this can be present in both children and adults of all ages. So it's not a great way to necessarily think about it with age and things like that. But you may want to consider age with the associated differential diagnosis of what's being presented to you in the vignette, and then linking that to whatever imaging finding you can find in the picture. So Annette had a great point earlier about sarcoidosis, linking something like young to middle age African American females with a, a, a an enlarged medial stinal picture of that hilar adenopathy. You know, seeing that on a chest radiograph or a CT scan is going to be a slam dunk for something like sarcoidosis. Linking a history of regardless of age but somebody missing their pulmonary, uh, their, their uh, dialysis appointments or somebody with a history of coronary artery disease and a heart attack coming in now with what looks like a wide mediastinum with, with difficulty breathing, crackles on lung exam. Now you can think, okay, maybe this is pulmonary edema on the imaging and therefore a new diagnosis of heart failure or volume overload in the right clinical setting. Um, what other things can we maybe link together in that? Anything One thing I thought of is when I was thinking, because usually when we go through all of our radio, like I can't usually tell if it's a baby or an adult. I mean, maybe with a really small infant, but the one thing is the thymus that you will usually see in an infant. And besides having obviously a smaller chest wall cavity, um, the thymus is a big one to let you know that you're looking at a young, like a young baby. Yeah, they call it the thymic sail. It's a often right-sided structure. It looks like a big triangle that is on the boat of the heart. So that's where they call it a thymic sail uh, sign. It's a, just a normal thymus and a tiny kid. I think it's fair game for step two, but you wouldn't see it on step one. That's right. It's it definitely on a pediatric shelf. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then there's a question. If you had the three main study materials, what would they be to, like what, what we would recommend for step one? I would say you world all the way to practice tests and first aid. There's I a couldn't, to add on, but those are the, my three. Those are the, the OG best resources in our opinion. And we don't even get paid by these people who even make these resources. We're saying this as people who have tons of experiences tutoring medical students like you. We've gone through these tests just like you are. Um, we've tutored between the two of us, it must be hundreds of people at this point, right? And I mean, all of them have had exceptional success with those three main resources. And remember that all the resources that happened um, that are available now, whether it be Sketchy, whether it be Anki Dex, whether it be everything, they are all derivative of those three resources that Annette just mentioned, First Aid, UWorld, and Practice Exams. All of the resources that are available after that are simply derivative of the OG resources. And I would just like to mention that my First Aid book is my step one first aid book it's still in my house i have the pdf on my laptop and i still refer to first aid almost every day in residency and studying for my like pediatric exam i am not throwing this thing out this thing is okay. staying with me forever and i've made it my own i've added my own pages to it and notes and outlines and illustrations and all of these other things to help me master the material so it is never leaving my sight. This thing is gonna forever stay on my bookshelf. And so bouncing into step two, I also recommend step one's first aid for step two. It's not gonna cover everything, but step one is the basis for everything. And so having that book to use as a, an additional resource when you're going through your step two you will questions is extremely helpful. Especially if you don't think there's great textbook resources for step two. I would agree with that. There's really not a great textbook resource for step two. So really you world for step two becomes absolute king. Um, you know, that is just the best thing that you can use. It covers all of your subspecialty areas. Um, but really, and I would argue that this is maybe even more important than a single Q bank, but the best resource for step two CK is having adequately prepared and studied for all of your shelf exams throughout your third year of medical school. The shelf exam questions are simply repeated over and over and over again on step two. And if you did well on your shelves and you really read something every single rotation, and you, you put the work in and you did UWorld questions throughout your entire third year, going through UWorld again and really, really putting your best foot forward to prepare for those shelves sets you up for ultimate success for your step two CK. 
any other questions out there with regards to really anything about test prep or radiology or or anything out there? Otherwise, I think we can call it a, a night. I don't see too many other things coming coming through here. Best way to review UWorld for Step 2 CK. Um, we have lots of webinars and blog posts on this, so I encourage you to check those out. But really, the strategy does not change um, from your step one preparation. Adequate step one preparation sets you up for success for all the USMLE exams. Um, and going through them in the same way, understanding why you got a question right or wrong, being able to tell um, why the other answers are wrong for your particular question and understanding the classic presentation of disease, which is what those vignettes teach you are really the, the greatest fundamental advice, pieces of advice I can, I can say. Read the vignette fully or the explanation fully and refer to your other resources with each question you do. Well, we appreciate all of your attention. We know this was a bit of a longer webinar, but hopefully super high yield for you. Hopefully we've inspired you to pursue uh, careers, maybe even in imaging science. So uh, if there are any future radiologists out there, um, thank you for tuning in and, and uh, being inspired. And even if you're not going into imaging, thank you for doing the harder job of clinically correlating. We very much appreciate your help in that area and uh, wish you all the best of luck in your exams. You guys are gonna do great. Um, we are so excited to have you as not only attendees, but our colleagues. And if there's anything that MST and Blueprint can do to help you achieve your goals in your career, please just reach out to us. We are happy to provide any kind of resource or advice session um, that you need. And on that, I will say good night. Any closing words, Annette? No, well, great job, guys. You were super involved and active in this webinar. We really appreciate it and we appreciate your time. Uh, so thanks for having us and being here to um, having us here to and listening to everything we had to say um, and all the teaching we got to do today. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks again. Everything. Bye.